All right, let's get this started with a couple of questions from our Patreons. Ian says, will the women's IPL end up with the same number of teams as the men's version in future years? Do you think it's a concern about talent depth or wanting to restrict the length of the tournament that has led to the initial decision of having six? Well, Ian, uh, they didn't want many teams to begin with. So I don't, uh, you know, it's the whole talent depth thing is nonsense. There's enough talent in women's cricket in India. Um, that isn't the problem. The problem is that none of that talent has ever been developed or professionalized or moved forward. So you could have had the exact same conversation 10 years ago with women's cricket, and many people did. Uh, it's one of the reasons that the IOC um, said that uh, it wasn't happy to allow cricket into the Olympics. It said that the standard of women's cricket wasn't strong enough outside of about four teams. You could say the same about all these domestic leagues. Having said that, look at the 100, look at the women's big bash, look at fair break. Talent's not the problem. Getting these people professional training, uh, used to, you know, weights and physios and dietitians and playing games day after day, not just once a week and all those sorts of things. So it's, it's nonsense. When, when you say, oh, the, the standard of women's cricket isn't high enough. Well, if you made a professional competition, it would get high very quickly because they would turn professional and it did not take very long with the women's big bash. So we saw that, um, uh, I, that, that said, I don't know if you need to start with the exact same amount of uh, teams as the men. And we've seen, was it, the CPL had three teams. So uh, I would probably would have started with the same amount as the men. I don't really understand why you wouldn't. Um, but you've got to remember, they've been talking about this since, what, 2017, 2018? They have procrastinated and procrastinated. They look for every excuse not to do this so far. So uh, we can we can sit there and be negative that it isn't enough teams. Um, or we can say at least it exists. And I think at this stage, at least it exists is something. Um, and we keep pushing them to hope that they, you know, eventually just have all, or, you know, as many teams as the men where there's no reason not to. Aditya says the reactions to run out on Sunday at Lords. So that's Deepthi Charmer, Charlie Dean, um, uh, have taken a clear side with a for or against. Most issues in cricket really create such a clear binary. Why do you think man cutting? Uh, he says, I don't like the term, has managed to do that. I do like the term. I know that Vinu Mankad's family don't like the term, but that's because they have been convinced by generations of idiots that uh, that it's a negative thing. It wasn't a negative thing when Vinu Mankad did that. We know because Bill Brown was involved at the time um, uh, and he didn't say it was negative and he was the man who was run out twice within a week by Vinu Mankad, right? Uh, been a, a, a Bill Brown was the best runner between wickets in the world, was getting an unfair advantage at the, you know, at the non-strikers end, and he was run out. That's all this has ever been. Um, uh, it, it, it seems to be in certain cultures, uh, I mean, England specifically, but it's not just England. There are other cultures as well where this has become a moral issue. It's not a moral issue. The batter is out of their crease. If you are out of your crease when the ball is live, you can be run out. That's not a moral issue. And and it, it was really, I suppose, around the 1950s, probably around when, when Vinu Mankad was, was involved with it, where it really changes um, what it is. And uh, after World War II, there's certainly a romanticism that se seeps back into cricket. And I think because of that, um, there is the romantic side and then there is the law-abiding side. And I think that the laws weren't always written perfectly for this as well. The whole idea that you had to warn people, all this sort of stuff, it, it gets an icky reputation when I don't think it needs an icky reputation. Um, I think if you leave your crease when the ball is live, you can be run out. And I think it should be that simple. And I think it probably will be that simple in the future. It, it seems to me that certainly there is an age discrepancy here. Not, not completely, but it does seem that younger people are a bit more like, can't you stay behind the line? And older people are like, oh, that's not, that's not the cricket I signed up for. Um, and uh, the game will change. And it's uh, been happening for almost 200 years since the first recorded one, right? So it's not, in, in this case, it's not exactly something that's new. It's just something that will be used more because there's more reason to use it. Christopher says, if you could American football or cricket side play the best 11 batters and uh, the seven best bowlers with, with specialist fielders, what team in history would be the greatest? And is there any that weren't the best, but they have such depths, they would have improved a lot more? I mean, the minute you do that, I think the West Indies, obviously, with their bowlers and their fielders probably, um, get a lot better. Um, you know, you have people like Roddy Eswick who uh, never played test cricket but had a first-class bowling average of, what, 20, 21? Um, you know, has been their, their coach over the last couple of years. Um, fantastic cricket brain. He's like one of 
heaps. <laughs> you know, they 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 could have had six or seven, but especially from that what seventy eight to maybe eight period, maybe ninety period, um, up until sort of Patrick Patterson and and uh, falls off and uh, Ian Bishop gets injured a lot. They just had multiple options. Um, also, would have allowed the West Indies to probably pick a specialist spinner, even if, you know, even if spin had had decreased in that era. I'd be shocked if they weren't decent spinners. Their batting probably wasn't quite as deep, but they would have got good. Australia, uh, you could have been able to play Warner McGill uh, through their peak period, and you would have been able to play Colin Miller slash Tim May, um, Brad Hogg. You know, so their spin uh, would have been really good, and then. You could have played Lee Tate um, without any fear in a seven-man bowling attack. And Australia's batting is even deeper. You know, Matthew Elliott, Martin Love, Stuart Law, uh, Jamie Siddons. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the others. You know, Brad Hodge. You know, those sorts of guys. Divinuto, um, or late, late career Divinuto, Jamie Cox. Uh, there's a lot of talent that didn't obviously filter through the team. Murray Goodwin. Uh, is probably another one. Wouldn't have had to go play for Zimbabwe in that case. As far as less down teams, I had a really good thing about this. I, I don't get a chance to see all the questions, uh, Christopher, but I did see yours. Um, I really can't think of a team maybe outside of like current day New Zealand would be an interesting one. Maybe current day New Zealand and, and India seem to have so much depth with their bowling, maybe even South Africa. And with India, with their batting, would that be quite handy as well? So current day India might be one that, that I was thinking about. Traditionally, though, I was thinking maybe around the 1950s, 60s England teams where they seem to just, you know, some of those teams are just absolutely stacked, but they didn't quite dominate at the level that you would assume that they should have at times. And I do wonder if um, in that situation, if you could just, because they had, so many bowlers who would come in and average like 23 and 24 of the ball and then would never play again, whether they ha would have had the ability to do that and also pick more spinners and develop their spinners a little bit more in your seven, uh, was it seven bowler lineup that you had? Yeah. Um, so from that perspective, that was the, that were, they were the ones that came right off the top of my head. You've got some good teams in New Zealand and Pakistan, obviously in the eighties and even, you know, later Pakistan team. Uh, I'm not sure that they ever had the depth though, that you would have needed to do that. But Pakistan of recent, you know, that sort of era where they got very, very good, got to number one in the world. I did wonder if you could have picked their top three spinners and rotated their four quickest bowlers. And then, you know, uh, Fawad Alam wouldn't have been left out for so long in, in your kind of a lineup, right? Um, so I do think that, but I don't, I don't know if 11 batters Pakistan particularly had. Uh, but Pakistan of the 80s, I don't think they would have been that much stronger if you'd allowed that. New Zealand of the 80s, I just don't think would have. I think they basically had their 11 to 15 best players um, in that lineup. Um, and those are the ones that come off the top of my head that would have been more... Uh, um, yeah, so I think that England era, maybe late New Zealand, Pakistan in that good period, um, and um, India uh, would be really interesting. I would have thought that a team that would be really interesting if it's not test cricket, Christopher would be England in T20 cricket, um, or even one day cricket, but certainly in, in how much better that they would be if they had, you know, uh, the 11 best batters. I don't know if any team, they may not be the best T20 team in the world. They probably should have won the last world cup, but injuries may have done that, but maybe they were the best team coming into that. Uh, they might win the next one. They might not, but, uh, structurally, you know, of the best 20 to 25 players in the world, you would say at the moment, they probably look like the best team. And as far as batters go and bowling depth, you know, the ability in, in your seven, seven bowlers lineup, you could probably have Parkinson and Hal, um, you know, and uh, uh, so, so suddenly they don't feel like they have to bowl them. They could just bowl them when things suit, uh, which would be quite an interesting thing. Uh, and then you've still got, you know, Rashid and, um, you could maybe still use Mo and Ali's bowling, uh, you know, with his all-roundedness and whatever. And then you have, you know, a bunch of different seam options that they have available to them. Um, it was a really interesting question. AB says, if everyone was fully fit, what would you say is England's best T20 eleven? <laughs> That's funny because I just went through that. It seems like there are a few must-picks and then a lot of options on the fringes these days. Um, obviously, Jofra uh, is a no-brainer. Uh, you would want Moeen and Adol Rashid. Um, 
you probably need Chris Wokes for the new ball option and then, you know, strengthening that batting a little bit more and allowing the guys at the top to go are fully, are fully in. You want probably Bairstow and um, you probably want Bairstow and Butler opening the batting. I suppose if you want that spare bowling option, I probably want Ben Stokes batting at three. Uh, although it might be Phil Salt batting at three. Um, ben Stokes may be batting at four uh, with Moeen Ali, obviously, as that swing position. Um, uh, and then you'd have, um, oh, God, I've completely forgotten his name. Liam Livingston uh, is probably there and thereabouts. And then if you, I wonder if, depending on how you feel about your lineup, if you probably need one more specialist batter in there. Um, but you, there's so many different, one thing I like about it, because they have Wokes, Moinelli, Stokes, and Sam Curran, they can actually go with radical lineups in either direction. So I'd almost need to put all the pieces on paper in front of me because I don't think there is an ideal 11. What there is, as I just said, because of their depth, is the ability to completely switch um, and change things around. Um, and so uh, that's almost the, the ability that they have because of those all-round plays. Even Livingston's all-round ability um, comes in there. Uh, Graham says, really enjoyed your recent piece on the Kookaburra Ball. If you haven't seen that video, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, uh, still haven't got a complaint from Kookaburra, but I'm sure I will. Has anyone ever looked into the white ball not being made from leather? Yes, uh, Kookaburra did. Um, there has been talks of it before. The problem is that with a cricket ball, and I think they've had the same problem. In, uh, actually, maybe they haven't in baseball. There's another sport, though, that I looked into this when it came to leather. The, uh, we need a, a material that degrades. Uh, in a certain way. And we've never really found that. I don't know if you've ever played with, you know, plastic balls or um, cork balls or any of those other sort of variants that, that you sometimes get in junior cricket. They just don't degrade like a cricket ball should. And so it does... Ow. <laughs> Bang my arm. Um, so it does change what the cricket game is at that point. And I think that causes us uh, problems. But there's no doubt that, you know, uh, th th having a cricket, a leather ball causes us problems. You can't keep, especially over 20, 50, 80 overs. Um, you know, even the Dukes at their best or these new Kookaburra balls that are better or SG, you know, completely firing, there's always going to be soft balls. They're always going to hit things and, 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 and get damaged in a certain way. Um, some of them are going to degrade well, some of them are going to degrade poorly, all those sorts of things. So having synthetic, not to mention rain and moisture and dew, so it has been talked about. We just, no one's really worked out how to do it well enough yet. Um, uh, I think um, what really needs to happen if, you know, and this goes back to the video is there's a few things that need to happen. One is making sure that the white ball actually works. Another is in, uh, ensuring that the pink ball um, is of a standard close enough to the red ball that it doesn't cause any issues. And then, and then the third one is looking at a ball that, is going to be better served when there is moisture around, i.e. rain or dew. Um, but that would need someone to be in charge of world cricket, and the ICC is not really in charge of that sort of stuff. I don't think they would ever spend their money on it. Uh, they're not about to buy a Kookaburra or buy a controlling stake in Kookaburra. Um, and so we, we are where we are, sadly. So if Kookaburra come up with it and they think it's worth it for that market, um, they'll do it. And if they don't, maybe someone else will do it and try and uh, you know come from nowhere. Um, but it's not looking optimistic at the moment. Uh, Will says, do you think the popularity of test cricket in England is at least partly due to them not actually being very dominant at home? Yes, they win most series, but against big teams, it's often very close. The quality of cricket is high compared to India and Australia, where whitewash is a commonplace, uh, which, although fans obviously want to win, becomes very boring after a while. Look, I've heard this argument a lot. First thing I would say is in Australia and India, they want their teams to be dom dominant. That suits their culture. Whereas England, with this sort of post-colonial guilt <laughs> at times um, probably don't feel quite the same way. They want more. I've always felt that England fans on general in, as, a, as a, a mass want a better contest. Whereas if you're just comparing it to India and Australia, they probably want their teams to win. Um, there's also different ways that, you know, in Australia and India, there's more of a football culture of, the way you support your teams, whereas England is much more that cricket culture of, you know, um, you know, um, uh, cricket is the real winner, right? You don't really get that as much in, in other things. So 
I certainly think in that in that um, in that way it's different. I would say that in the ground, I've never felt this, though. Um, I do feel in the ground that England fans just want their teams to win. I think that's more something I've noticed in comment threads, in uh, you know, talking to people who are massive cricket fans, uh, Twitter, and those sorts of places. Uh, the other thing you would say is that um, the popularity of Test cricket is really high in Australia, and it was really high in Australia during the uh, period where they dominated as well. And um, so I don't think there is that correlation goes back. James says, do you think that cricket culture has developed such an aversion to trick plays? I like the man cat or we're all in on the man cat today. I suppose kind of had to be in other sports like baseball, uh, the hidden ball trick international. Yeah. Or, or, or that, um, the fumble, uh, fumble risky. Is that what it's called in football? I'm trying to read your thing. Sorry. Or the statue of Liberty play. Um, uh, they get seen as something special. Yeah, I mean, we've got a weird history with trick plays in cricket. You know, there was the one where the wicketkeeper used to take the ball, turn around behind them um, and pretend they'd missed it and try and get a stumping. Uh, you know, that fake and, and all the fake fielding stuff, those are those were legislated out of the game. Um, trying to think of some of the others. Um uh, you know, bowlers coming in and waving their arms, things like that, um, legislated out of the game, um, moving fielders back. Uh, so, you know, when you're in your position, the fielder has to uh, stay in their position or come forward. They can't move back or sideways. Uh, you know, in, in, so we do have a, uh, a thing within the game that makes us uh, go towards that. I don't think Mancad is a... Um, uh, I don't think the man cat is a trick play, <laughs> weirdly enough. I never saw it as a trick play when I played. So I've tried it in outdoor cricket. In indoor cricket, it's the most common thing in the world. Um, I never saw it as a trick play. I literally saw it as the same way that when I was wicket keeping, um, I was constantly looking at the feet of the, of the striker. When I was bowling, I'm constantly looking at the feet of the non-striker. Um, uh, just seeing, you know, getting, well, not the feet, but more that, the, where they are in the position. So I never really saw that as a trick play. Um, but I do, I mean, you know, I do, we have legislated against a couple of them. Um, the stutter ball was another one. We had the stutter ball, although baseball, I think also uh, legislated against that one, didn't they? Um, uh, but we had, you know, Xavier Doherty and uh, I suppose even Syed Ajmal um, at a point, you know, doing those sorts of deliveries. So, yeah, I do think there is something there uh, to your question. And it's really interesting. Sandeep says, any idea why running out a non-striker while they were backing up is called man-cutting and not barkering? After it was Thomas Barker, who was the pioneer of this act in the 1830s, doing it no less than four times. Well, this is an easy one, Sandeep. A, um, uh, 1835 is your, your, your first answer, I think. <laughs> well, 1834, whichever year it was that he first did it, um, is the first answer there. Um, uh at that stage, I wouldn't have thought we were at a culture where we necessarily always name things after people. So, so there's an interesting part of that. The second one is that it wasn't international, right? There was no international cricket back then. It wouldn't have spread around the world in the same way that Bill Brown, an Australian player, being a man uh, or sorry, being run out by Vinu Mancad uh, twice within the space of a week, uh, that would have got global coverage everywhere it would have been on the wires it would have been spread out to everyone else everyone in cricket would have heard about that over the space of three to nine months i would have thought the way that the, the newspapers used to work in those days um uh, and the fact that he did it twice back to back uh i'm not saying that that barker you know as, as you said barker did it several times i think there were some other players who might have done it several times as well um but he the, i think that that vinaman can did it twice back to back I think it was a very, very uh, big part of it as well. But I think the biggest part of it is really that the game changes after World War II to be this look back to this pious, conservative, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the sort of conservative thing of, oh, the cr cricket was better in our day um, angle. And I think that the whole spirit of cricket thing really becomes a much bigger deal after World War II than it was before World War II. And the era that they're really pining about is nonsense right it's it's an era where wg grace openly runs out players on the field who are who are gardening right you know you could easily say that uh, most players wouldn't be run out in that situation 
uh, W.G. Grace changes the scorebook. Um, you know, W.G. Grace refuses to leave the ground. W.G. Grace is an amateur but gets paid more. Victor Trumper, the very, the most romantic figure, the most pure cricketer almost ever, goes on strike, right? But once you're in the 1950s, you're far enough removed from that that you only remember the good old days of the gentlemen and the cravats and all that sort of stuff. And cricket is becoming more international. It's less English. It's becoming more of a pastime. Amateurs are, are, start, are no longer dominating the game in England. Uh, even the amateurs around the world, it's no longer the sort of amateurs where they come from money. It's just that you, if you're an amateur in New Zealand, it's just because you can't get paid to play cricket, right? So you have to have a day job um, and in Australia as well. Um, and so all those things are changing. And so there's this whole thing to go back to what the spirit of cricket was. Well, the spirit of cricket is Thomas Barker and it is W.G. Grace. And it is that bloke who turned up at um, Hambledon with a bat, the width of the stumps. You know, it, it is, um, is it, uh, I want to say Jane Austen. Is it Jane Austen's nephew? Uh, I, I forgot the detail. Jane Austen's nephew who tries to bowl over arm and gets kicked out of Lords. And uh, that is the spirit of cricket as much as anything else is. Players have always been like Trevor Chappell, like David Hooks, like Kyron Pollard. Um, always been pushing the laws and twisting the laws and trying to make it work for them. Um, and the real spirit of cricket is, is something I think if the spirit of cricket exists, which it doesn't, but the, the real strength of cricket is that it overcame so many bad parts of society, so many wars and uh, kept getting stronger. And um, it, it had an ability, like, unlike other sports to actually strike at the heart of culture so much so that, entire nations sort of grow through their cricket teams um that for me if the spirit of cricket exists would be what the spirit of cricket is i think for a lot of people it's clapping the captain when they come in um it's not it's not sledging it's all these different things and that's why we can never agree on what it is and so the the, the man cat thing is just simply that he did it twice within the week in international cricket at the time when people were pining for the good old days. And, and I think all those things sort of came together. Um, uh, Sashmo says, what is the worst weather you've experienced in a cricket ground? Uh, well, I've been at Lords when it snowed, uh, but that obviously wasn't during a season. Um, uh, yeah, been, uh, I think there was a, there was a game in Sri Lanka. I'm trying to remember. I think it was in Colombo. I think, I don't remember what the ground was. Um, God, I should know. There's so many test grounds in or international grounds in Colombo. It wasn't Pisara, it wasn't SSC. It was one of the others. Um, and yeah, I, I think it was like knee high water. Um, uh, I, was it England, Sri Lanka? It was it one day or a T20? And I remember us being really worried that our entire studio would flood. Um, it, and it started to hit while we were there. And then, yeah, it was impossible to get out of the ground. I think that's the worst one I've been at. Although my favorite story is that Harmy tells me a story when he was playing up in Durham, he was playing in a first class game and he, um, he played in a game where the, the temperature never got above 10 degrees, but combined over the four, four days. <laughs> It's like two degrees one day, three degrees another, two degrees or whatever, whatever the numbers were. Um, which sounds horrible to me, but I wasn't there for that one. Thankfully, I think I've had some pretty good storms, probably some good Gabba storms as well. The Gabba is a good, uh, good one for that. Um, the worst I felt in a cricket ground was when I was school, uh, school, um, uh, uh, broadcasting for Talksport, st uh, si stand, uh, sitting on the roof of the Gaul Stadium, uh, and the, the heat coming through the concrete, uh, plus the heat of Gaul. Uh, really hot days. I basically was cramping almost 24 hours a day during that test match. No matter what I did, I could not keep any fluids uh, in me. Just absolutely sweating. Uh, I don't. I think it was the first test match I ever did for Talk Sport. Um, it was probably one of the worst things I've ever done. Um, you know, physically, it just my body just didn't handle it um, at all. Um, and yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty terrible. <laughs> I think I had to see the England doctor. I think I had to see the England doctor twice in goal two different things in, in that in that test um i think i had an ear infection or something um i was doing a lot of swimming anyway there you go so those were bad that was bad um uh kennedy says what's your uh most least favorite of the laws in cricket i think my least favorite is the back foot no ball uh that we went to the front foot no ball in some ways i think it's made fast bowlers specifically 
it's almost basketballized. I don't know if that's a good word, but it's got people a lot taller in in bowling, and I think it's restricted the amount of impact that uh, shorter bowlers can have. But more importantly, I think it puts huge impact on the front of on, on the front of your body in the way that the back foot no ball law didn't. And I know there were problems with the back foot no ball law, but I don't think the front foot no ball law is a safe law to have. Um, Oh, it's my, my, my most favorite law. Um, most favorite law. Um, that's a really good one. I, I mean, I, it's funny. I've got so many coming through my head. I can't even, um, I can't even think of something really specific. I, I like the fact that you can't be out LBW if the ball pitches outside leg stump because I think that whether that, I was I was on a basketball podcast recently where when when the basketballer started to get very tall, someone wanted to move it to the ring to twelve foot, and that was a big thing. And and I wonder what basketball would be like. And at the same time, if the LB, if LBW and people occasionally still say, you know, ah, oh, let's make it better for bowlers. Let's allow bowlers to bowl LB to have LBWs to pitch it outside like some. I think the entire game would be ruined by that. I mean, ruined is the wrong thing. It would be ruined for me. I think it would be ruined aesthetically, and I don't think it would be as good a sp sport. But other people might still like it. But but yeah, I do think that that would be a um, a terrible, a terrible uh, thing to change. There must be something else though. I handle the ball. Handle the ball is great. It really annoys me when batters pick the ball up, even when it's dead. Um, it's a really, it's a really frustrating thing. I, um, I was commentating the minor league uh, finals uh, for uh, you know recently for ninety nine point nine four, and it was just like, no, stop picking up the ball, guys. Uh, so I love that law. It's not your ball. You'd never have to pick up the ball. And I like the fact that if you do, you can be given out. And I think you should be given out almost all the time. Um, uh, Nadika says, why is it that Pakistan have historically produced a conveyor belt of fast bowlers while the current generation, India, has struggled to consistently produce good pace bowlers? Um, until the current generation, yeah. Um, uh, Pakistan conditions in the pitches are quite different. Uh, pitches in Pakistan are usually batting friendly. Pitches in Pakistan uh, degrade the ball in a different way than they do in India. And pitches in India just spin a lot more. Pakistan doesn't spin that much. You need good spinners in Pakistan, but look at the spinners they generally have. Um, it's usually, I suppose, their, their main strength has probably been wrist spinners or finger spinners with, a, with an element of mystery, right? That's not really the case in India. Wrist spinners don't do as well because the pitches do a lot more. So you can your finger spinners are probably more you, like uh, more likely to get your wickets there. So in Pakistan, your players have to be, and this, this Pakistan and Australia are really similar, weirdly, in that your players have to work out how to break through and take wickets um, in those sorts of situations. And I think that that is specifically why Australia. Um, and Pakistan maybe have slightly more traditionally quicker bowlers than some other parts of the world. Doesn't really explain South Africa in that. But um, another place that's a bit like that is the West Indies, where you have flatter pitches that quite often don't really help any form of bowling. And if that's the case, you kind of need that extra dynamism. And usually that's pace, right? And, and if it's not pace in Pakistan and Australia, quite often it's been wrist spin. You know, uh, you know that the. the the majority of the best wrist spinners of all time seem to have come from, a, you know, Grimmett, O'Reilly, Warren, um, and and then, you know, uh, Kudir, uh, and, and Mushtaq Ahmed, and Yasir Shah for the, you know, first 200, you know, first quickest man ever to 200 wickets, right? It seems to be that there is a reason that, that that happens. And I would say it's to do with the pitches not giving as much assistance to a particular kind of bowling. And so therefore you need your bowlers to kind of rise above that. And I think in Pakistan, that was probably a combination of wrist spin and 90 mile an hour bowlers who can tailor it in. And in Australia, that's probably been taller and taller bowlers who can rely on their height and a little bit of wrist spin um, on the side of that as well. Um, yeah, cool. I got through all of them. Let's see what we've got in the room. Uh, big big shout out to uh, Bodyline T-shirts, by the way. I've got my Manus Lebeshane T-shirt on. Uh, so thank you to them for sending that one through. And let's see what people have in the group here. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah. 
Nikhil, you there, mate? Nikhil? I've got you, mate. What's your question? A bowler's less important uh, in T20 cricket than in test cricket. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, well, you can't win test matches without bowlers who can take 20 wickets regularly, right? There's no way of winning that match if you don't have that. So bowlers are hugely more important than batters are um, in that in that situation. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I don't I don't think there's many people who would disagree with that. In T20 cricket, you don't need to take 10 wickets to win, and in one day cricket, you don't need to take 10 wickets to win. Um, and so is Bumrah's injury as much of a setback as maybe a Surya Kumar and Judy Kumar, for example? Yes, because I would assume if Sky got injured, you would be able to find a player roughly of the same ability to replace him. Whereas if Bumrah gets injured, I would assume that the drop-off is far bigger. Just because that's just an Indian team thing. If you're saying in general, uh, you know, the best batter and the best bowler, that might not always be the case. But in this particular case, that... The next best player behind Sky is probably going to be able to replace a lot of what Sky does. The next, the the the, the fourth best bowling option is not going to be able to replace a lot of what Boomer does specifically. But your general point is still true, right? Which is, you know, uh, I mean, the, the the best one is the last World Cup final. Australia's best bowler gets absolutely hammered. Hammered, probably the worst white ball game Mitchell Stark's ever played in his life. Right, absolute god of white ball cricket has an absolute shocker. But Australia just scored too many runs, so it didn't matter. Um, and and you know, essentially, um, in that in that kind of in that kind of situation, it does tell you that you can do that. You can score eight hundred runs in an innings in a test match, but if you can't bowl the other team out, you can't win. Right, so it's a completely different dynamic altogether. Would you rather be batting heavy or bowling heavy then as an idealist or I mean, or as a T20 uh, captain or a T20 manager, would you advise a team with, say, limited resources to be more batting heavy or more bowling heavy? And just one last point in this, how, how far have we come or has it ever been discussed by ICC committee or stuff like that about maybe allowing a bowler, particularly in the limited overs formats, to have, uh, say, a T20 game for just four overs so from four overs, having them to bowl five, then you get both quality bowlers, avoid bits and pieces, all rounders maybe. And uh, yeah, I, so I just wanted to know in relation to this, have that ever been seriously discussed? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the first question is I mean, I would say that England and the West Indies at times have tried to bat as many batters as possible into a lineup, and that allows you to swing as hard as possible, which should mean that your, your base innings is going to be 280 to 290 i'm uh, sorry 180 to 190 which means that you're going to win a majority of your games just because that's hard for the opposition to chase um the i mean it does a, but it does eventually get back to the, the you've got 120 balls on on defense and 120 balls on offense in t20 cricket right uh if you maximize if you're if you set your lineup so you maximize uh your batting you have to make sure that you're scoring 20 to 30 runs more to overcome the fact that you don't have as much bowling. And, you know, it's much more like football or basketball in that perspective, right? Where, you know, so you've got, you've got a team who knows they can out you, who can score 10 more points than everyone else. But if their defense allows 10 more points than everyone else, that doesn't matter. So it still matters what the other side does uh, from that perspective, unless you have a historically great batting lineup, right? Where your number eight, um, averages 20 at a strike rate of 160 and your number nine uh, averages 17 at a strike rate of 150, then maybe you would have that. But you've still got to worry about the defense 
on, on in that sort of stuff. Uh, the other side of things, look, I've been talking about it for years. I think it's more something they've looked at doing in one-day cricket. Um, as it currently stands, uh, I don't think anyone's seriously done it. I've written about it. I, you probably find some of the articles on it on Substack that I've talked about before. I think it would improve white ball cricket. I think the 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 thing is that the whole tw- uh, each bowler uh, bowling um, twenty percent of the innings is like it's just an arbitrary number. It doesn't need to exist. <laughs> um, I think there should be. I, I think there should be a limit. All rounders may not like all rounders may not like it because suddenly they might go out of out of demand. Well, okay. Because lots, uh, lots suddenly you might lots of things okay, can do that. Backs. Yeah, but. If we had more good all rounders, we wouldn't have as many shit fifth bowlers, right? Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I've said before, I think T20 cricket will end up being 15 to 18 players in a team and you'll just um, change plate pillar around and there'll be an upper limit for the bowlers just so we don't have, you know, Rashid Khan bowling 10 overs. Um, but I, I, I see that as a potential going forward of uh, literally having 10 batters in your lineup and five bowlers. Um, you know, and one of the batters being a wicket keeper or something and, and doing it, stuff like that. So I think they're more likely to, pro- I think there'll be a league that will do that in very soon. I think the big bash wanted to do it and shit themselves a little bit. Part of the reason that no one's done it is because it's more expensive because you need more players. Um, but it would completely distinguish yourself from all the other leagues. Uh, thanks, Shadow. Thanks for your question, mate. Uh, I've got a couple more. Basky there. Hey, Jared. <laughs> How you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, so I wanted to, I was thinking about the Ricky Ponting's captaincy from 2003 to 2011. And I was just looking at the record. Post obviously won and McGrath retirement, right? And then his record did not, like, he lost uh, two Ashes and, uh, like, that couple of series in India and uh, that, that, that the Bacal series against South Africa overall. So did his the captaincy really get worse or it was just the quality of bowlers uh, which he lost uh, and the batsman he lost in, in that way because uh, the record is very stark uh, uh, when he came in. So it was just being a uh, captaincy career too long and being jaded about it or it is just like that he just lost the two bowlers. But yeah, and also he did not win any ICT trophies post-2007, right? In the uh, ODIs where Vaughn and McGrath was, like McGrath was, uh, sorry, Vaughn was not slaying and McGrath was, oh, okay. Yeah. They won the champions trophy, didn't they? That was in 2006, right? And in India. Oh, was it? Yeah. I thought that was after that. One in South Africa in 2008. Yeah, so that. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought they won one, I thought they won one trophy without McGrath, but I can't, uh, maybe, maybe I'm misremembering that. Um, uh, the, uh, they lost Gilchrist, and by that I mean his form completely fell away. Um, so there were other issues there. Ponting's own form falls right way around that period as well. Um, they probably, they went with the Mitchell Johnson, Peter Siddle, Hilfen House when Stuart Clark was still, should have played some more games. Um, uh, McGill's knee fell apart, which no one expected. Brad Hogg retired after playing one or two tests, which again, no one expected. Um, so there was a lot going on. Uh, they had to replace replace Langer as well. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to remember if Hayden's form fell apart. I can't remember if 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 he was struggling as well. But it certainly wasn't as good a team. It basically Brett Lee. Brett Lee was brilliant for about two years and then retired from Test cricket as well. In that period, I, Brett Lee had an, an extraordinary. After he had a very ordinary Test career. And then had just a brilliant two years right towards the end. Um, uh, so there was a lot going on with that team. Uh, I think Hussey, I'm trying to remember, after Hussey had scored brilliantly and averaged, what, 80 off, off the first 18 tests and then averaged 30 for the next 15 or 20 tests or something. So there was a lot of, there was a, a lot of problems there. That, so I don't think any of that is, it's not that Ponting got better or worse as a captain. I think it was... Uh, I think it was more that a lot of those players were either not the players that they had been in their peak or they just weren't around anymore. Uh, and, and they didn't have the strength to uh, at that stage. There was a whole generation of batters, the sort of George Bailey, Mark Cosgrove, um, there's a few others in that age group who I think everyone thought would be top level international batters and never came through. 
Um, so there wasn't a lot of batters who came through after um, that other generation sort of uh, dropped off. And so it meant that they had to try people like Usman Khawaja and Phil Hughes, probably when they were both a bit young. Uh, st even Steve Smith, you know, the first time was really young when he played, right? Um, so there was, there was certainly that. And then with the bowlers, Hilfen House, probably by the time he got to test cricket, just wasn't the bowler he had been before. Uh, Peter Siddle lost a bit of his pace as well, a bit like Hilfen House. Mitchell Johnson didn't really, couldn't really do what he wanted to do consistently at that stage. Um, and uh, that would have been the carousel of spinners as well, right? So it would have been McGill, Casson, McGain, Hogg. Did Gavin Robertson have a comeback? I can't remember. Maybe not. Uh, Jason Crazier. Maybe Gavin Robertson did have a comeback. I think Gavin Robertson might have... Cameron, Cameron White, Marcus North was used as a spinner. Um, so there was no spinner at all at times, or the spinner was broken. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't, it just, you know, I don't know how you captain that side. Uh, you know, a, a lot of that time, it would have been very hard. And I also don't think that Ricky Ponting's main skills as a captain were strategic. So his main skills as a captain were the way that he made players feel, um, uh, and and the professional environment in which he was very much part of. But I don't think his main skill was, I've got an average bowler here, but I can get a wicket out of this situation by doing this. Um, and and so because of that, uh, he didn't have very far to go um, uh, when it comes to tactics and everything else, uh, I, I would have thought. But no, I don't, don't think he really got any worse. But the team was a lot worse um, uh, for a long time there. And, uh, you know, and... There was a lot of, I mean, I'm trying to remember because there's so many different years, but there was a lot of issues there. I think the Stuart Clark one was one that I, I just, they decided that he'd lost a yard of pace and that he couldn't play anymore and that, that Siddle, Hilfenhaus and Johnson were their, were their saviours. And I think now you would look back on that and we're like, they probably could have got an extra year, year and a half out of Stuart Clark. Um, uh, and that would have helped probably, you know, uh, that would have helped. Not to mention that they had Ryan Harris around at that stage and they weren't using him. Um, he could barely get into South Australia's team. <laughs> so they it's not like the talent wasn't there. Um, they just weren't, it just wasn't really coming together. And there's a lot of very young players like Cummins uh, being thrown into teams, hoping to find the next saviour, which is a very Australian thing of, oh, we'll just throw them in and they'll work it out. And it's like, well, they might, or it might take them two or three years. Um, and, you know, with a lot of those players, it probably would have. Um, it did take a lot of that, that time. Uh, but thanks for your question, mate. Uh, oh, I've got someone else here. Ollie, are you there, mate? Yeah, it's Jared Hyde. Can you hear me? I can hear you. What's your question? Uh, so I play um, club cricket at a very average level in Surrey, and it seems like every club here has a, an overseas Australian who all claim that the, the standard of Aussie cricket is, is much, much better at that level and that, you know, great cricketers over there on the first grade could play county twos or county ones. And A, is it true? And then B, why, why do you think that is? Club cricket's really weird in England. Um, when I came over to play, I played for Barnes, uh, which is in the Middlesex League, I think. I should know that. Um, and the year before, I think Darren Sammy had, no, Muhammad Nabi had been captain or played in the ones. The year before that, um, Darren Sammy, or a couple of years before that, Darren Sammy had played for them. We had a guy who went on to play about five or six games, an Australian overseas player who went on to play about five or six games for um, South Australia. He was a good cricketer, never quite made it uh, professionally, but was definitely a top-level cricketer. Uh, I think the first year I played, Alan Richardson was opening the bowling against our ones. Um, and yet the level of cricket was really low, like comically low. We didn't train... There was no real preseason of any sort, nothing organized. No one got to the game beforehand to do any fielding or anything like that. And I think a lot of what we're saying in Australia is that we don't have that. I, I, if you play cricket in Australia, there's usually some level of proper training around it. Um, and we're, our, our grade cricket doesn't have people like me just rolling up and playing in the seconds of thirds when Muhammad Nami and D Darren Sammy can be in the firsts. Right. And that is the thing that for South Africans and Australians and probably New Zealanders, 
doesn't make any sense because our best club cricket is all play at one club, right? And whatever that district or grade or, you know, um, it's got a different name in every city. That's kind of how it works. Do you think Maybe they just come down for like how the English see the sport compared to how everyone else sees the sport? No, I just think that there, there is no, there is no real special, um, there's no, because in Australia, club cricket is the most important thing, right? So you have to have a strong club system because you, you, when you play club cricket, that is how you get picked for your state side. So if you're playing grade cricket in Melbourne or, you know, sorry, district cricket in Melbourne or grade cricket in Sydney or whatever, what, whatever that level is in those other places, you might be, it might be you who's just turned up and, and you're good enough to play in that. If you play three good games, you could play for Victoria, right? That isn't really a system that you have in England at all. It's much more about squads and training camps and uh, school systems and, uh, you know, getting you're involved with the Surrey under 14s and all this sort of stuff, right? And uh, it's completely different to Dirk Nannis at the age of 28 playing his first full season of, of club cricket, bowling 90 mile an hour left arm and literally getting picked for Victoria straight away, right? That system doesn't really exist in England. And the only way it can work in Australia and uh, is, for, or is for one level of club cricket to be really strong. So the rest of club cricket is more or less the same as, as, uh, uh, as the way that cricket works in England, right? But you have to have that level at the top because that is our second, our second 11, right? Um, that is where you're getting picked from. So you can't have a bunch of duffers playing at that club because it needs to be a really strong club. So even if you play, if you play fourth uh, 11 district cricket or grade cricket in Melbourne or Sydney, the quality of that cricket is probably the, the, the 11 players there, you, you, would be higher maybe than a, a, a team in, in the Surrey League or the Middlesex League, right? The difference is that the Surrey and the Middlesex will have a gun overseas player and might have a couple of local players who are just like, you know, they decided to work in the city rather than end up playing in Surrey twos, right? But then you're going to have the old fat duffer who, who, who plays in the middle, but, um, you know, he used to be okay, but he's around. Whereas even in the fourth level of, of, of Australia, it's very different. So the actual level of club cricket, but it's also a lot of it is that we have very average cricketers in Australia who get much better at the lower level because they're training properly. You know, to play at my, I played sub-district cricket, not district cricket. I played junior district cricket and then sub-district cricket in Australia. If you didn't train twice a week, you were very unlikely to get picked on Saturday. <laughs> Right. You had to you had to do four to six hours of training to be able to do that. If I got demoted uh, from seconds to thirds once because I was working and I couldn't make out um, I couldn't make the hour warm up before the game. Right. So I, we had to be there an hour and a half before the game uh, to do our hour warm up, and I missed it, and I got demoted the next week. That's not anything that happens in English cricket, and so. You know, when you see the Australian players come over and they can field and they, I, I've played with cricketers who are proper cricketers in England who don't seem to have basic fielding skills. And it's just because they haven't spent enough time running and fielding. And, and because they didn't go through one of those academies, one of those junior academies, they don't, they don't have it. That's one huge advantage for Australia. The other one is that in order to make a first class team, you really do have to overcome that sort of club cricket environment and by having it as that super strong level of club cricket at the top and it, when we call it club cricket it's important for you to know it's not really club cricket <laughs> it really is a super structure those guys play uh i think they bought all 80 or 90 overs on a saturday and a sunday in, in some of those leagues um they sometimes have midweek um games as well uh, it's it's almost semi-professional at times uh in the as i said training twice a week uh we did pre-season my club as I said, we were sub-district and we did pre-season um, uh, uh, camps <laughs> um, where we, we played one game against Northcote, which were a district team. And like we had, you know, one of our players was like an accountant from our seconds and our first opener wasn't available. So our seconds opener had to open up. The opening bowler on the other team was Mick Lewis, who a year and a half later was opening the bowling for Australia. Like it's ridiculous. Um, you know, that we had to go on a two day camp and this accountant is having to do it, but that is kind of how it, how seriously it is taken. Um, in Melbourne, when I was growing up, you 
people wouldn't put a wedding on. There was like one weekend of the year where everyone had their weddings. And that was because it was between football and cricket season. Because it was seen as disrespectful to your club to have a wedding on a Saturday when you were supposed to be playing, even low-level club cricket, right? And to the point at which I never went to a wedding, uh, and I mean the actual wedding, I went to a lot of receptions, but I never went to a wedding until I quit cricket because they were all, except for Sri Lankan weddings, which quite often on Friday or Saturday nights, but for the, 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 the other weddings, um, I never went to any of them because my, it wasn't, in my family, you just did not take off a, a cricket game for a wedding. Now, think about everything I've just told you, and now think about English cricket. And you're talking about the Surrey League. That's not a small league. That's a strong, proud, famous cricket league, right? Everything I've just said would sound ridiculous to you, right? Absolutely. Right. And, and so it does lift the overall stuff. And, and the other thing I would say is that in English cricket, the only in club cricket, you know, I don't, I haven't played in the Surrey League, but I have played in the Middlesex League and I have played some other, uh, other cricket. People take it really seriously when they're playing. There's so much cheating in English club cricket. It's phenomenal, right? You know, creative as well sometimes, to be fair. No, but what I mean is there's so much cheating, but I have no problem with you doing that if you are literally putting in the extra six hours a week to train, if you're getting there an hour beforehand and doing fielding drills, if you're working through team tactics and all this sort of stuff. No, there's no seriousness to English cricket until the game starts. And then a bunch of like middle-aged men suddenly think they're playing in a test match and they're all trying to out-cheat and, and be creative, as you said. It's quite funny. But I was just like, it actually bored me because I was like, you guys aren't taking this seriously. And then you're all cheating to beat each other. It, to me, it, re- it was actually quite a frustrating environment to come into. Sorry, just booted my phone. Um, and so it is really, really different. Uh, South, I think, you know, either in South Africa and New Zealand, I think their club cricket is a step down from Australia. I think Australia really is a special. And you do get little bits like that, you know, um, uh, probably uh, Chennai is probably another another place where club cricket is, you know, uh, you know, really, really powerful and strong. Uh, Barbados is probably another one. Um, and, and there's reasons why those places probably, you know, get so many great cricketers. Um, but it, it I, there is a, I enjoyed playing cricket in Australia, um, but I did find that the seriousness and the macho nonsense was painful and, at times in England, I certainly enjoyed the, uh, the, the more laid back nature of it. But having said that, then sometimes I was just like, did someone just hit me a couple of catches before I go out and field in the slips? <laughs> um, and you know, and it, you know, it's a really, really interesting thing. You play a lot of the charity games over here and you literally, you be, you'll have Andy Caddick bowling to someone who's never picked up a cricket bat before. Those sorts of things don't really happen in Australia. Um, so that it, it uh, the, the, this, that that sort of link, the the distance between the best and the worst is the most interesting thing in England. And I think if you were an Australian player who could play and you came over and you're dominating the Surrey League, you would probably think that you would quite easily slip into a second eleven somewhere. Um, what you and I probably know is that there is thirty five people. So what would there be? 20, well, maybe 25 plus the junior academy, you know, you, you, so you're looking at about what, 35 people times 18, roughly, um, uh, that are top level professional cricketers. And then there's probably another, you could almost double that with people who decided not to take up cricket professionally um, and don't play it that seriously anymore. So I used to play with Alistair Cook's brother, uh, who would easily walk into any, you know, uh, first team. Uh, you know, in club cricket, probably anywhere he wanted to, but didn't want to. He wanted to play in the thirds. L- you know, lovely guy. Um, and um, uh, the, I think in Australia, and if you look at the great cricketer account, you get a really good idea of this, of it's much harder to do that sort of thing in Australia than it is in England, where that's m- much more accepted. Um, and I think in Australia, it's more, even at the lowest possible levels of club cricket, everyone is expected to dive or put their body on the line or take a ball on the chest. Whereas again, you and I have played club cricket in England and the opposite is true. <laughs> um, <Absolutely. laughs> you know, you're almost told not to hurt yourself, right? Um, so there is a very big difference between how the two cultures think about cricket. Um, and in many ways, cricket in Australia developed as, as a form of football. 
it's a team sport. You put your body on the line and whatever, whereas cricket in England is not seen in that kind of way. And so let's say, let's say you had someone who's a really, really good cricketer who in, in Australia or England who decides to go off and make money as a lawyer or whatever, and they don't decide to go pro. Those people can still take their cricket really seriously on the weekends in Australia. Whereas you and I know those sorts of people in England probably only play seven or eight games a year because they're actually going on holiday for half the year and they skip this game because they've got a, a bunch of weddings or, you know, they've gone to the races or whatever that may be. So that even if they're a similar level of play in Australia, they're probably still at a level where if everything breaks right, they might end up with a sneaky big bash contract when there's a bunch of injury or a big bash game when there's a bunch of injuries at one time. Whereas in England, chances are they play so little um, and they're so inconsistent with that and they don't do any training anymore that, you know, even though, and you see these guys in English club cricket all the time, you see their techniques and you're like, this guy should, is a proper cricketer. Um, and then you look at their numbers for the year and they're like, they played six games last year and eight games a year before they made 180 in one game. And then they never passed 20 in any other game. Um, and it's just because they're not working on it. Right. And in Australian cricket, that sort of, even at club cricket level, you're probably training, you're probably more involved, you're probably expected to perform more and you're not expected to be involved for six or seven games a year. That's traditional, traditionally in Australia. I haven't been there for a long time. I haven't lived there for a long time. People are telling me that that's starting to ease off a little bit more and casual cricket's becoming uh, more of a thing. But when I grew up, there was no casual cricket. <laughs> there, if you were playing for the, you know, Camberfield fourths against, you know, the Kilo Down fifths, um, you're expected to bleed for your team and you're expected to go to training twice a week and you're expected to have meetings. And, you know, we, we used to have, um, I, I was on the selection uh, committees of a couple of, you know, as I said, lower level teams, not district level teams. We would have four hour selection meetings. <laughs> like, can you imagine in English cricket? English cricket is literally like, are you available? Yeah. So it really is a completely different world. Um, and so if you do come over from Australia, um, it's, uh, it is, it's glaring, I think, uh, is the best way of putting it. Anyway, mate, thank you very much for your question. In fact, I thank you everyone for their questions. I think everyone else is asked theirs. There was just one from YB who said, I read in Jones and Lehman's book. Uh, oh God, I what's that one called? Something the lines. I've, I've, why have I forgotten the name of it? Hitting across the line. I've forgotten the name of their book. Sorry, but, uh, ben Jones and Nathan Lim, go buy their book. It's really good. Uh, that in order to play aggressively, consistently and hit boundaries in limited overs cricket, one can't play each ball on its merit. As a batter, how do you train for this? Yeah, uh, hitting against the spin. Thank you, Ollie. You remembered it. I knew it was something like that. Um, yes. So it is impossible to play a bowler over 80, 85 miles an hour without doing some form of premeditation. Premeditation? Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, and so essentially uh, what you have to do is you pick your zones. So you know when you're facing a bowler of that pace, okay, if the ball is here, I can hit it here and here. And if the ball is here, um, I can go over there. And those are my my spots. Um, and of course, if the ball you know, is something else, but essentially, um, uh, essentially you, what you have to do is you have the first... Um, I think it's three meters you can track the ball. Then you have to do a saccade with your eyes and move forward. So by, after that first three meters, you have to decide what your shot is. So um, that, there's a form of premeditation even within the delivery itself. And then there has to be something. The faster the bowler gets, the more batters usually narrow down their zones. Okay, if he bowls wide here, I'm going to slash it over here. And if he comes into my pads, I'm going to try and flick it over the leg side. Those are going to be my two shots against this guy. And if he goes short, I'll just you know try not to get hit. Um, so there is a huge part of that. How you train for it is really interesting. Um, Trent Woodhill is the best one I've ever talk, heard talk about this. He basically talks about, you know, getting you your three or four areas of boundary hitting. Um, and then if you have the ability, if they bang it in short outside of stump and you can flick at it or something, you know, that is the, almost the improvisation, um, shot, but you know that you're going to have this. And that, so what he does is he says, okay. So your best shot is your cut shot, but they're not going to bowl short and wide outside our stump. How can we get you to cut balls that aren't short and wide? And that's how they train players to be able to do that. It's really, really interesting stuff. I don't think I've ever... I, it must be in some of my work. Um, 
uh, but I can't remember what off the top of my head. But the whole thing of how we play fast bowling, one of the most fascinating things, and it's the same with baseball and tennis, and all the little cues that we pick up and, and how we actually go about doing what we do because we should be able to, you know, hit a shuttlecock back and, and, and all those sorts of things. So what we read and what decisions we make beforehand are really, really important. Anyway, I'm going to end this podcast here. Remember, Bodyline T-shirts, Manus Levashane, 99.94. Go out there, listen to all the podcasts. We're adding more every day. Double Century is now weekly. Awesome. Uh, so excited for that. Uh, the next episode is on Argentina or Canada. I forget now. Um, it's a cracking episode. Well, both of them are cracking episodes. Um, Argentina is fascinating because of how good they were. Canada's got some really cool, quirky little stories in their history as well. Um, but follow the whole 99.94 network. It's really, it's really worth it. And uh, we can get more and more done. Um, and obviously, we're uh, I'm expanding Red Inca very soon to a third day of a week as well. Um, and we're going to try, uh, I, I don't know if we're going to keep with Spotify Live. Spotify Live actually worked very well today, but as you might have noticed, you've been listening a lot, it hasn't been working brilliantly. Um, so we're looking at maybe going back towards YouTube and, and, and streaming it there live and, and going out. But lots of new and exciting things coming up. But thank you very much. And I will talk to you all very soon. <laughs>